Okay, we're also um, moving the microphone closer. Um, so first of all, I'm sitting at a table with four very important artists and artists actors. So I'm going to basically going to get out and maybe ask them a few questions to get the conversation going. I hope you will have a chance for you all to ask questions as well. Um, so first, if I could just have a moment of introducing Tom accomplished, uh, award-winning uh, film, TV, theater, actor, radio broadcaster, comedian, playwright, and director. In fact, I imagine a lot of people in this room have seen that. Seen that action. Um, his work often engages with socially urgent issues, uh, particularly uh, violence affecting youth and his Love Life Foundation focuses on an issue of great impact. And we will be hearing about that, I'm sure. Uh, and then we have uh, Erica Gordon and uh, Ali Gordon, who are sort of a powerful uh, mother daughter team. Um, they are uh, surrogate daughters of the Navy Tim And in 2009, they started the Navy Tim Lady Foundation, which is a very important foundation uh, to work on issues of civil rights and to keep the legacy uh, of the Navy Tim and the Navy Tim first alive. Of course, there's also a performance group. Okay. Uh, um, Jeans started. Yes, so I just um, increased it. And if you want to introduce yourself, just to introduce yourself. Okay. 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 Okay.
And so a lot of the actions like the sit-ins were devised to put the oppressive racist power structure on its back foot and off balance with the surprising intervention that was devised by the group that had less power. And these were successful actions. So this awareness of the idea of let's be creative with our suffering, let's dramatize the issue. This term creative suffering was essentially, we're suffering anyway, let's get creative so we can win real victories with our suffering. Humor is not always appropriate for every uh, social justice campaign, but of course, as, as Mr. Lacey has shown, it can be very effective, right? Um, I was in Cairo during the revolution, during some, doing some artistic activism there. You had an old man in Tahrir Square holding up a sign saying, Mubarak, resign already, my arms are getting tired. <laughs> you know, so that kind of thing, even in a dangerous context that I've seen it around the world, where people find ways to use humor in their, in their activism, both for their own uplift and to surprise their opinions and satirize their opinions. Right? Um, so having said that, uh, I'm going to just move on to uh, our speakers here. And I thought I would just start with a question, just to get some the conversation going. And by the way, uh, Donald Lacey needs to leave at 7 to go to a show that he is in. He has kind of managed to do this on an evening where he's actually performing, so we're very grateful. Um, I just wanted everyone, maybe we could just kind of go down the, the line, and if you could just answer in a few minutes, what was, can you name a major event that influenced you in the work that you do? And uh, maybe talk about who your influences are. It could be an event uh, that happened, or um, an artistic thing, uh, artistic influences as well. All, all, all were known to be uh, I'm Eric Gordon Taylor. Um, actually, we are cousins to Emmett Taylor. Cousins? Yes, we're not just, we're cousins, but we're also um, surrogate daughters, goddaughters to Emmett's mother. Um, and I say that because what influenced me in life was Emmett's mother and his grandmother. Um, she called me the grandchild she never had. Six months old, I grew up in the house with them. Uh, my mother was in college. To help my mother finish school, I stayed with Emmett's mother. Um, growing up, I, I would sleep in the bed with Emmett's grandmother, and she would tell me stories. I would make a little story to tell her stories, you know, as a child. And it wasn't until I became older that I realized the stories she shared with me were stories that, you know, they were true stories of her fond memories of her and Emmett. Um, I traveled with Mamie very often in my lifetime, and I would hear her share the story of Emmett. I would witness people see her and recognize her as I would take her as I got older and I would drive and I would drive her to the grocery store. Someone would recognize her, fall to their knees in the aisle of the store and lay their head in her lap and cry. And I would get upset because at that time, you know, she was just made to me and I had something to do. I probably had a date or something. And I'm like, oh my God, really? Can we hurry this up? And this lady's bawling and just like, oh, you know, and hugging her and embracing her. And to me, not, not really understanding the moment that was happening in front of me until later. But I was also an Emmett Hill player, which was a touring troupe. She trained children after Emmett died. She trained them in Martin Luther King's excerpts of his speeches. And we learned those. Not, not just learning how to recite a speech. We really learned what the speeches meant and how to recite them. And we traveled across the country reciting those speeches. And she trained hundreds and today, we are lawyers, we are attorneys. All of us are professionals in all walks of life. I'd say 90% of the young men are clergymen. She influenced so many children. She influenced myself. So the work that I do, I'm a speech therapist by trade. Um, but things change in life. I've had two kidney transplants. Maybe was on dialysis. When she went on dialysis, I, I wept because I knew what she was about to embark you know, upon. Um, we've had so many similarities in our lives. But what really impacted me was mainly traveling and seeing her and not understanding that from six months of age I was being trained to continue the work because she didn't have any more children. I was the one that God had ordained to continue with the work she had started because there was no one else to do it. And so that is why today I have the Mamie Till Moulton Foundation, which I've dedicated myself to 100%, and I'm blessed to be in a position to do that with my mother's health and my, and my husband's health. So, you know, when you ask what influenced me, that influences me. And what drives me is what you just stated. A lot of people didn't understand how bad things are. Things are bad today. 
When you have the children that are being gunned down, especially in Chicago, when they're calling it Chirac now, things are very bad. So we have to be dramatic in what we do. Dramatize everything, whether it's humor, whether it's dramatic, you know, whatever, however you want to do it, we got to get down to it because we're losing our children, especially where I'm from. So, you know, that motivates me and what influences me is my, my legacy of my family. Thank you. Well, I would say that um, Emmett's mother was my greatest influence. Uh, my family, um, I guess at about age three, I remember meeting her. Uh, my family migrated from the state of Mississippi uh, to Chicago, to the Chicago area. And Emmett's grandmother was the person that uh, afforded other family members, members the uh, financial abilities to come from the South into uh, Chicago. And as we migrated from Chicago, from Mississippi to Chicago, of course we stayed in the house with Emmett and his mother. Um, and, the, and it was a family building. Um, Emmett and his mother lived on the second floor and we had Emmett's um, grand, great uncle, his, his uh, mother's uncle, lived on the first floor and eventually they modeled the basement, and my family lived in the, in the basement area. So my memories go all the way back until age three. Up and I think that I was about seven and a half, almost eight, when Emmett was killed. So I do remember Emmett. Uh, I remember uh, attending the same uh, grade school, Mackay School, as he did. I can remember him being uh, fun loving, a jokester. He loved to make people laugh. He loved to entertain people. And I would probably, probably had he lived, he would have been a comedian of some kind. And I think that he would have done very well in that field. Uh, so this is what I remember of him. I remember uh, that he was my protector. And I could get, get, into some, get him in trouble all the time, you know. He was like that big brother that could meet you do whatever else and nobody would have better follow you. Uh, so I knew him. And knowing him and having that bond, and then growing up in the house with uh, his mother, I also became, she was a teacher, and I became a teacher. And as life went on and she began to uh, age, she used to tell me, Ali, someone needs to carry on my work. And I would never commit to it because it just seemed like it was so tiring and never ending. But I said, I can't do that. <coughs> but here I am. Uh, and so, I think that I know I'm motivated because her voice and her wishes will echo through my voice and through my behavior as I continue to carry her work on. Uh, I went into uh, special needs, socially maladjusted uh, students, and behavior disorder, uh, where I found my niche. I did teach for Chicago Public Schools for 34 years, which I did 17 years inside Cook County Jail. Mm -hmm. How I ended up in the jail, God only knows. But it was a mission. I always call it missionary work. Because as I um, taught these young men and women 17 to 21, I found very quickly that I had to address the total person, not just from an educational standpoint. And it was so rewarding to see these young men and young ladies start to really uh, gravitate toward me for what I had to offer. And I started to see change. Uh, and then as Erica said, she did the oratory part. I started to work with them like giving her emotions and giving her feelings on paper. And I was amazed at what I got from that. And I was also amazed at how these students started to turn around. And I said, okay, this is my name. This is what's coming out. And I'm working with this population of young men that she so dearly cared about. Because many of them found themselves in situations that if their environment had been different and their home structures had been different, they would not have been in that situation in the first place. So my thing was to show them a different way of life and motivate them to want to go out and achieve and do that. And I would say my greatest reward was my first class. I had 17 young men in maximum security. And out of those 17 young men, 16 of them passed the DP test. And they used to sell it. I was like, everybody was like, wow, but I told you. One, only one did not take the test because he was released from jail the day before the test. And so that didn't really 
got inside of me, and I said, well, okay, if I can do this without little effort, although people kept telling me how it's working. My class was called the, the GED room, mm -hmm. and I didn't know that there was an officer at the door, one of the young men, when the new people would come in, and they would say, the only thing going on in here is rent. And <laughs> if you're not willing to pay the rent, do the work, then this is not class work because you won't last in here. How I motivated that young man to even be the gatekeeper, as I call it, I don't know. But I go back to Mrs. Moby all the time because she was my experience. She was my motivator. She was the first I guess, professional person uh, that I had been around. And she would always mold me and instill me and tell me what I needed to do and guide me. And, but as my daughter said, it was only when she died and I had the awesome task of doing her funeral that I really realized she used to always say, Ollie, I wish you could see me through the eyes of other people. Because I couldn't. She was just me. But then when the president started calling, mm -hmm. President Carter, <laughs> President <laughs> Wait a minute, maybe she just wasn't afraid. <laughs> right for all. And so here I am today, uh, continuing her battle against injustices and trying to mold young people to not just be the ordinary, but go to the extraordinary and continue to try and bring change in our society. And that's all because of the So, question again? Just what was, and I think, you know, it's, yeah. the question is what is the event that that's has motivated right. you or influenced you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I took with my son. And you don't mind if I stand to some extent. My son, Aubrey, has a, this is just a bigger, bigger picture of him that I carry around with me. Um, I've been, oh, I'm sorry. I've been, um, um, my son was murdered August 14, 2006. And it's been seven years already. And I, uh, I've been fighting this battle for that long, and not just for my son, but for other young men and women out there also. Um, my son was murdered in front of my house mm -hmm. to a semi-automatic gun, 30 rounds of bullets left that gun into my son. He just turned 17 years old. And uh, I, uh, I uh, yeah, he just turned 17 years old, and he walked out the house. Will you show our viewers as well? Thank you. Yes. Um, he just walked out the house and he saw the perpetrators going to shoot the neighbor down the street. And my son put himself in the way and said, run, run. And everybody ran that was on the stairs. And I think it was about 10 of them. They all ran. And the only person was left was my son. They walked past my son. They didn't know who he was. He was just a person walking out the house on his way to work. And everybody ran. The only person who was left was my son. And because he opened his mouth and said, run, they used him as the target and shot him 30 times. And to this day, I still think that's an overkill. And to this day, as his mother, I still think, why did you shoot him that many times? And he didn't die there. He died at San Francisco General six hours later. Uh, I don't know how his little body held those bullets. I just don't know. Um, but he was a fighter. He was always like what I always tell him. When we see crime or something on the street, say something. When I see people doing stuff, and I'll pull over and call. And they always see me doing that. And I know he did only what he saw me doing. You know. Um, so he leave behind two sisters. He was my only son. And at 17, they had to take his life. Um, that day my life changed. This, a part of my heart is gone, my arm, my lip, doesn't matter. This changes you. I never drank before, but I started drinking. But that's old now. I uh, finally got in myself. I said, I gotta stop doing this to myself. I need to get out and bring attention to this crime that's happening on our streets. 
So I started going to the healing circle with mothers and fathers who've lost their children to homicide and hate crimes or whatever it be. And I stood up, and that's why I'm standing up now, because we learn how to stand up. I always sit in the back, but I learn how to come to the front and say what I need to say about our children. Um, I, I talk with my pictures. I go down to 850, uh, down at City Hall. I stand in front of City Hall two, three days a week with my son's pictures. I stand in front of 850 Bryant Hall of Justice with my son picture because that is the melting pot. Everybody come in and out of there. Even the perpetrators. Believe me. I believe they saw me. And they probably know they shot my son. Six guys. Six grown men. Um, I, um, I don't have my pictures in order, but I, I take these pictures. He has, his father is from Nigeria. Me and his father are no longer together because he blamed me and I blame him. I go out to the schools to talk to the children. I go to San Quentin Prison because I needed to know why people killed. What put it in their mind to, to kill? Why did you kill the person that you did? You know, so I would go up to San Quentin and they would tell us, okay, we're not going to negotiate for your life if there's a riot here. And I'm like, you know, I, at that point I had lost everything that I had. So there was nothing more they could take from me. So I went in full force. And I would bring my pictures and talk to them and understand what made you kill somebody. It was, you know, I thought I was hurting by myself. But they say hurt people hurt people. And they do. Um, and I needed to understand why did you hurt your victim? Why did you kill your victim? Because I went in there with hate, straight hate. You know, and the perpetrator was there. Um, but I started realizing that, you know, like I said, hurt people hurt people, and it just wasn't me. They, they took their victim. They, they did revenge because they said, well, you made my mother hurt, so now I'm going to make you hurt. I'm going to take, you took my brother, I'm going to take your, your brother, you know. Um, so anyway, I, I needed to, to talk to kids because they think the bullet won't hurt them. They think that they're invincible. You know, and they could just walk out there. And sometimes I think my son thought that he just wasn't going to get hurt. And I said, a bullet doesn't have a name on it. It shoots you. It shoots whoever. Um, so, you know, I take these pictures to the school. And this is me standing over my son in the castle. And I tell these kids, I say, do you want your mother standing over you like this? It took me a lot to do this, and I didn't know I was, this picture was being tucking, tucking up me when I was standing over my son. It was a lady at the funeral home who did this, and I'm glad she did, because I don't hesitate, because I can stand and talk with my voice all the time, but if you don't see what I'm going through, you'll never understand what I'm going through. So I want people to see the pain that I deal with every day, that I have to deal with every day. Um, I also have... Uh, his father, and my, his fa like I said, his father's from Nigeria, he was standing over his son too. So, like I said, we're no longer together, and it's been seven years, and we're no longer together because of that. And um, I have no desire of being back with him, but uh, we still grieve for our child. And what inspired me a lot was listening to, you know, I didn't know about Emmett until I started standing out there on the streets. And I stood out there with my son's picture, his death picture, of his body riddled with bullets. I took, this was before the, this was after the autopsy, where they turned my son's body from head to toe, lift his face up off of his body, um, his rib case wide open. You know, I'm, people say, why do you carry this? This is my story. This is my pain. I still have no justice. The perpetrators are still walking the street. So I use this to keep fighting. This is my purpose for fighting. My son, um, him laying on a gurney full of bullets, 17-year-old boy young, vibrant, young boy, now looking like 
an old corpse, corpse on, on the table. So in the, in, during that time, you know, I still go out and I still talk at places like this. I come and tell my story, whether it helps or whether to let other people see that that uh, it just doesn't stop at my door. It stops. This can happen to anybody. You can be an innocent bystander. I go out and I go to the police commission and let them know, look, this crime needs to stop. We have no venue. I have no venue for my son's wanted poster. All I can do is go out to a pole and stamp it up there and watch somebody tear it down. So as much as you tear it down, the more I put it up. You know, I ask for a venue, put it on in the schools, put it in a public library, put it somewhere so the perpetrators are, so the crime can stop. I think if, if I saw, if I killed somebody and I walk around and saw this picture and I killed this boy, um, and I saw this picture hanging up sometime, I think twice. And I also think too, people of color don't get the justice that they deserve. And I'm gonna say this, if my, I believe my son was a little white boy, he would have been, his case would be solved now if he was a little white boy. If these pictures were hanging up and his face was white, I bet they wouldn't be torn down. This is what I have to deal with. This is my neighbors that I'm dealing with. And this is the system that I deal with. When I walk in the uh, courts and when I walk in the police commission, I show these pictures. And I know they're tired of seeing me. But I can't stop. I'll be doing this for the rest of my life. That was my child. He is still my child in death. And um, so this is what I do. And I, and, you know, like I said, I don't only fight for my child. These are other young men that I walk with their mothers often, and we go places and speak. And it's just not like I'm saying that. Even though these are colored young men, I have pictures of Pacific Islanders. Latinos, it doesn't matter. I have, I can wrap this building with it that I carry with me every day in one bag and sit down there and hang them up. Um, you know, um, I've also asked the police commission to, you know, these, we don't have, like I said, we had no venue. It's where were you when I was murdered? Um, these were on the buses, but if they're not up there long enough, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so that's what I do. Um, and you know, like I said, these are other mothers that I walk with every day. These two mothers I stay, I walk with and they've lost their turn. I wish that they would be here, they could be here tonight. But I wasn't sure what was gonna happen with me. But I'm glad I'm here and I'm glad I'm able to tell my tell part of my story. And that the crime needs to stop. It needs to stop. Uh, this is a mental issue. This is mental, mental on us as parents. You know, we can't go just take medication and say, oh, it's over with. It's not. This is going to be a lifetime feeling for us. So, um, I think that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm humbled and honored to be on the panel with such powerful women. Uh, I know this sister, we had a, a Town Hall meeting, Love Life Foundation. And that's what, that'll be the first time I mentioned the radio broadcast and she told me that story. Um, what shaped me was growing up black in East Oakland in the 60s, getting uh, handcuffed to the sidewalk because I had a big afro riding my bike on the sidewalk. My mother, when I was a small child, showed me Emmett Till's picture. And to this day, no offense, I've never dated a white woman. She told me that story, I was terrified of white women. Even in high school, a white girl say, I, I'd be like, sorry, can't talk to <laughs> keep walking. Right or wrong, but I'm saying, we grew up in, a, in a, a, an era of terrorism. And thank God we had the Black Panther Party for self-defense, who, you know, proselytized, educated us. I would hang out at the, I grew up in East Oakland. They're, they had uh, headquarters, I believe it was on 90th, 91st, somewhere around there. We would go by there. The brothers would talk to us. We'd watch them pull over the police when the police had somebody jacked. So I didn't have a choice in terms of activism. And as an artist, prior to the murder of my daughter, almost every work, I don't, nothing against entertainers. Oh, give my regards to them, bro. Nothing, but that ain't me. 
we live in serious times. In 19, since 1996, I don't know how many of you know this, almost 4 million Congolese have been murdered in that conflict that the U.S. is funding the rebels. Nobody bats an eye. You're right. Black life is cheap. This young lady right here is my 16-year-old daughter. Her name is Loisha, which is Igbo Nigerian, which means love life. And I'll tell this story as briefly as I can. First of all, it's not lost upon me why her life and death came and what it meant to me and the repercussions that it has. I delivered her in the car while it was moving on 580 Freeway. True story. I had one hand on the wheel and I was pulling the head. She go out on the floor. In fact, if you look at her birth certificate, you can look it up. Don't take my word for anything. It says place of birth, 580 Freeway. <laughs> <laughs> Attending physician, Donald Lacey, VD, baby's dad. I was the first person to say baby's dad. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I delivered her. She was a hurricane. She was this bright and brilliant light. And it says in the Bible and a lot of African cultures, the name of a thing or person describes that. And love life. So... I was going back and forth between L.A. working as a professional in the entertainment industry. I didn't want my family down there because um, I had more of a support network with my family here to watch my family when I was around. So I would go back and forth two weeks down, two weeks up, or however my schedule permitted. But in the summer of 1997, as I was up here, she called me. Uh, as I was coming back up here, she called me and the she was crying. I said, what happened? She said, well, a friend of mine, James Valerie, they called him Nunu, was murdered. Uh, right over there by her house, 26th and Chestnut, 30th and Chestnut. And she said, I want to do something. I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, I want to write a play about stopping the violence. And I remember telling her how proud I was because I was just impressed that she took her grief and became proactive. So when I came back uh, later that day, me and her cousins got together and we just sketched out some of the stuff. And we didn't really get to work on it, but Flash, Four months later, October 20th, 1997, as I was about to go on stage at the Improv, I got this 911 page. And I always tell people, do not page me 911, because usually when people page you 911, it's like, what time does the game start? You know, that kind of stuff. So I always say, don't. But for some reason, I didn't think it was nothing bad. I thought it was something trivial. But uh, her mother was crying, could barely tell me that she was killed. What had happened was uh, she worked at McDonald's. A B student, she was a conflict resolution mediator, which the city of Oakland and all its infinite wisdom canceled the program because point blank it was too effective. And don't let me get on my soapbox about why these things are like they are, but long story short, she was coming from her job waiting at the bus stop with a friend of hers who her mom had took in, who was having trouble with her mother. She was seeing some young man who was kind of in the game, as they say. What they didn't know, she was sitting in the back seat of this van, and he was in the front, and Meyer, her friend, was in the uh, front seat next to him. As soon as the car stopped, four individuals walked up on the van, shooting at him, and he ducked, and she took all of the gunfire. Seven bullets penetrated her body. And uh, so my first reaction, because I've never been involved in street activity, but I always knew people who were. And I got plenty of calls that night from people who said they knew. But let's be clear, we know who the murderers are. When the police say we don't know, that excuse my language, that's bullshit. And forgive me if I get a little agitated, because when I hear this sister's story, you don't understand, since this happened 16 years, all I've been dealing with is death. Death. And, and the part that just bothers me, nobody is batting an eye. Even our so-called leaders. Barack Obama had to be shamed to come back to Chicago. 500 plus murders, that's an outrage. So my initial action was to get revenge, but I talked to my grandmother, who's 101. She just passed away two months ago, and she told me something. She turned me around. She said, grandson, what the devil meant for evil, God was going to turn to good. And then I thought about the conversation I had with her. And I said, no, I'm not going to, I don't want, I called everybody else coming and said, no, leave, don't. Let justice be served however justice is served. But what I want to do is make something good happen. I want to take her vision and do something. So my friend, who I've known forever, stopped his job. We started operating his office. We didn't have any money. And, you know, that's another sore spot. You have all these nonprofits. No offense to anybody. Get all these money because they write good grants. But the rubber ain't meeting the road. Trust me. Trust me. The rubber ain't meeting the road. So we just got involved with these youngsters. 
and my nieces started helping me, my sisters, my friends. We, to this day, we don't have a board necessarily other than family and friends. And if I had made one mistake, it's a lousy administrator. I'm not no pencil pusher, but I do know how to mobilize people. We mobilized thousands. On the spot where she was killed, we had 2,500 people out there. Barbara Lee was there, the mayor. We marched through the, the town of the killers. Even some of the killers were there. So I say all this to say that I feel like I'm fighting a 12 alarm fire with a squirt gun. But the good news is, while I lost one, I've been able to reach thousands. And I don't get paid to do it, nor do I care to. Nor do I care to. It's the right thing to do. Don't wait till the bullet hits your door to get active like my sister or other people. This is a national emergency. And what is so alarming again, even our black leadership, they're not doing shit. And I don't, know, I don't know what else I have to do. I got invited to the White House, and I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, but I'm going to speak the truth. I don't care about making people uncomfortable. I'm sick of eight-year-old kids opening the door and getting shot up. One-year-old babies. This is ridiculous. We should all be ashamed of us. I'm ashamed to say I live in this country. And because they're black, no one is batting an eye. Oh, we need more witnesses. Bullshit. There was a lady, God rest her soul, who was jogging in Concord. They found a cigarette butt. They convicted the man on the DNA. There wasn't a witness. The witness was the cigarette butt. So you're telling me when it comes to solving the crimes for black kids, there's a burden of proof that you don't care to endeavor. But this white one, no life is more valuable than any other. Yes, that was horrible what happened in Newtown. I cried for days. These are babies. But it happens every day. And nobody's that guy. So cut off. Yes. Uh, art can be active, but we need to be like in the civil rights movement. We need to start turning over tables in City Hall and saying enough is enough. Do something about saving our kids' lives. Otherwise, we deserve what we get. I, um, I had a quick question, but I also kind of want to open it up. So I want to ask, how long are we going until? I know that Mr. Lee has got to leave at 7, and are we going to end at 7? 7.30. Oh, 7.30. Okay. So um, maybe because you're going to leave, can we get some, I have a, kind of, I have a question, but I'm going to hold it back so people in the audience can ask some questions. Does anybody have something you'd like to ask the panel? Yes. Um, I'd like to um, ask Donald. I met Donald, um, my two sons were with Oscar Grant, and I had Oscar Grant was murdered, and that's how I met Donald Lacey. You know, and what bothers me is like when you tell your story, like you know, being an activist. This was it started getting to me. One time I was at a sports bar, and a mother walked up to me and she said, "You did a good job for Oscar Grant, but who's our boys now?" I'm like, what do you mean? And she was like, "You know, the mothers out there that lose their sons every day, but we're not. Who, where's the when a one-year-old baby is killed? Where's the outrage for that?" But when a white police officer kills Oscar Grant or Marley Graham, you tear the whole town up. But every day, 500 murders in, um, in, 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 in Chicago, 135 in, in, in um, Oakland, 100 and something in San Francisco, 500 in, 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 in New York. But there's no outrage when it's black on black or brown on brown crime. But, and, and no disrespect, but it's like the white protesters who come out to do that. But why aren't you doing that when our young men are being killed? That's a, I, I couldn't even imagine what, what you and Donald were going through because every day I live with that fear of losing both my sons. I call them every minute, where you at, where you at? Because I know plenty of mothers that lost their sons. And there's no outrage. There was no outrage when a straight-A student named Terrence Kelly, mm. he played football at Bay LaSalle. He was on his way to Oregon, scholarship, had a future ahead of him. The night before he was about to go to Oregon, he was shot eight times. Donald know this man. He shot eight times. There was no outrage about that. There's no outrage. I know what you like. There's no outrage about your son. You know, and that's one thing we have to change. In order to change our community, we have to show that outrage when we're losing our sons and daughters and our babies. Not even that, we're losing grandmothers who are being shot too. A 49 year old woman walking in Oakland. She was shot, mistook him, they hit the wrong person and killed his grandmother and told her grandkids I'll be raising her grandkids, told her grandkids I'll be back, I'm going to the store. The grandkids, who's gonna raise them now? The domino effect that this has. And and we start, we need to start being outraged about what happens to stuff like this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
I would like to say quickly, there's something about showing the lost one, the body or the image of the lost one, that is a commonality to everybody. So when you show the pictures of your son, we have this image here that no one's going to forget this face, right? And of course, as we know, historically, 1955, what did uh, maybe Tomoli decide to do? Well, she showed the body. She left the casket open. She left the casket open. Didn't thousands of people come? Yeah. And she wasn't ashamed. You said you weren't ashamed. She said she wasn't ashamed either. Who needs to be ashamed are the perpetrators of the crime. She said that she wanted to leave that casket open because there was no way. She said no one will believe Christ. Okay. And there was no way that she could describe to anyone what she saw in that box. Yes. I have a question about that. I've um, seen the documentary that was on maybe that was aired. At, uh, the Untold and, Story. Yeah, The Untold Story. And I'm not sure if it was from that or another piece where I, I read a piece where it said that if it happened today, she's not sure, she wasn't sure that she would have left the casket open. Is that true? No. No, no. she would have done it. She would have done it um, because she said uh, that she could not uh, describe uh, the, grotesque, the grotesque, ugly face of racism. Mm -hmm. And this is what she wanted the world to know and to see. See, Emmett by far was not the first young man to be killed in that manner. Yes. But in 1955, we had television, which was able to send these pictures all over the world. And it caused an outcry because this was a child. And people in other countries just could not believe that this was going on. Yes, it had been going on for years, but now there was a media, there was a creative way of our missions. Don't out. forget Jet Magazine. Well, she Jet allowed them to take the photographs, mm -hmm. the iconic photographs, mm -hmm. and publish them, which was the major. So to, to have, to have, be able to get it out through mass media like that, and to show the world, she just, and her spirit, which we all, I think, it just, that spirit runs through the veins of most of the women in our family. She would have opened it today, especially with what's going on today. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And she would be on the forefront fighting, fighting today. She fought to her death. Her last public appearance, she died a few, about a few weeks after, she spoke against the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So she was moving and shaking even in her last week's life. So. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we have two problems. We have problems of, of people um, not accepting the African Americans as human beings and they uh, shoot us down, other groups of people, and shoot us down like it, and it, at the blink of an eye. And it doesn't mean anything to them. And then also we have the African American who will shoot us down because we don't mean anything to them. To them. I'm an art teacher, um, and I'm not talking about years ago, I'm talking about recently. Um, me and me uh, worked with children from five to 17, and a little five-year-old, we did masks, and he made this, and I, always, I still have to encourage the black children to color themselves brown, and, never, and they'll tell you in a minute, I don't want to be brown, I and mean, I understand how it's a system perpetuates the idea that black is bad. Everything is kinky is, is bad. Um, but this little child, um, when he got to making his mask, when he painted it brown, he poured a red paint all on top of it. And I said, honey, well, why did you do that? Mm. And he said, people die, people die, you see. Mm. Now, one of the things that as a uh, art uh, the teacher uh, studied the, the in part, importance of art. Um, that our children go through a school system that teaches them, um, that treat them like factory workers. And, and you know what happens when a person doesn't uh, keep up uh, on the line, they kick them to the curb. So uh, we have two problems. We have the problem of our society that hates us in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, the new Americans come here. You know, I tell them all the time, I, I didn't come through Ellis Island. I built Ellis Island. Okay. I am the pioneer 
of America. I paid the way for you to get here. And then when you get here, you turn your nose up at me. You cheat me in your stores. And then also you have to deal with the idea if I don't like myself, then I'm not going to like you. Right. And I'm telling you right now, today, there are black children who are growing up not liking themselves. And they not only get it from our society, they get it from their parents, and their aunts and uncles. So we have those two major fronts to fight on. And I just thank you, thank you indeed for sharing your stories. Because that means that they killed your boy because they didn't like themselves. And then they killed any deal because white people and other groups of people do not see our humanity. Very well said. I just want to say before I go, I hate to leave, but I'm already late. But I just want to echo what that sister just said. And part of the problem is there's not enough black men left. And here's where it really went foul. There was a white journalist who I had on my radio show. By the way, they're going to be on Saturday morning, so we'll tune in. But um, he's called Gary Webb, Dark Alliance. Don't take my word for anything I said. This, it cannot be overstated, the tumultuous effect. I grew up in East Oakland in the 60s and 70s. You know, you had to be home before the lights came on. Uh, Miss Johnson, Miss Butler could whoop my ass. We had a community and a neighborhood. It wasn't all this shooting. You could hang out in the summertime till 1 in the morning. So why did it change? It all goes back to when the so-called greatest president, that dog, Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. oversaw the Iran-Contra affair where Freeway Ricky was a CIA informant on the payroll that distributed crack cocaine of Highway 5 between L.A. and Oakland. And if you look at the murder rate in the black community when that, first, when that exploded in the late 70s, early 80s, it goes like this. Straight up, exponentially murder in black communities and then it spread to other black communities. But it, this also changed laws, the indeterminate sentencing. If you're busted with a rock, you'll get five times the time of some white collar criminal who's got a pound of powder cocaine. It's got so bad, Thurgood Marshall, one of the greatest men to ever live, quit the Supreme. He couldn't believe how, excuse my language, how chicken shit the laws became. This was all due to dark lies. Gary Webb was murdered because he fell upon this story. So there were some hearings that Maxine Waters initiated, and lo and behold, what happened, right as they were about to go from L.A., I was in L.A. at the time, I went to one of the meetings in South Central. Lo and behold, right before this was to go to Capitol Hill, guess what? Monica Lewinsky popped up, and the whole thing was dropped. So I say all this to say, Gary Webb unveiled the smoking gun of crack cocaine, which has warehoused more millions of black men in prison, more black men and women and children are dead because of crack cocaine. And that's where we need to start to see not only some kind of investigation, but some type of reparation, if at all possible, for the irreparable crime that has been done to our community by the U.S. government. And again, don't take my word for it. Look it up. Thank you all. I will see you, sister, soon. Thank you. Um. Oh, my daughter. I can't do my baby. Oh, baby. Yes. Um, uh, a little question um, uh, about the politics of uh, the Obama administration. Uh, as I understand it, uh, a lot of people who are poor in the black community and also in the white community for Malcolm X uh, supported, and many more supported uh, Martin Luther King. Obama comes from the Democratic Party. He doesn't come from Martin Luther King, he didn't come from Malcolm X, he doesn't come from the Panthers, he didn't come from any of those groups. How come most of the black people voted for Obama? voted for him because he was black. Yeah, well, that was a mistake right there. I'm just being honest. Is he black? Well, I'm just being you, got, you, you and we got tricked. He just described how many black people have been killed. Okay, how, many, how many people have I, been 
uh, exiled from the United States. How, How much, much, much damage so, so Ron, Obama has been doing? Okay, Ron, mm -hmm. so now let's hear the answer. I but, was answering, I voted for him because he's black. And I wanted to see a black president. He's and for my generation, okay, and he was Democratic, I'm Democratic. Well, I was. I don't know what I am at this point. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I don't know what I am. I might not be anything right now. But at that point, I was Democratic. I was part of the Democratic Party. And my generation, we got out because it was a dream. And that was a dream that we had been taught. I had been told we would never have a black president growing up. So for me, I wanted to see a black man as a president if it was going to happen. If, and it seemed like it was something that could happen. And it did happen. So yes, I did vote for Obama because he was black. And qualified. Thank you. Thank you. And if I might say so, many of us, no, many of us uh, had our reasons for voting for President Obama. I hate people saying Obama, Obama. They don't do it to the other presidents. Yeah. He's President Obama, like it or not. He came in and he had dreams, which we all know, that everything he wanted to do, he could not do because of the powers to be. He's controlled as well as all the others were. And what did he step into? What did he inherit that presidents before him left undone? You know, they couldn't change it overnight, and there's no way that President Obama is going to change it in two terms. Oh, it's getting worse. Oh, it's doing this. It's not getting any worse. He's trying his best to do some things. He does not have the final say so. We know this checks and balances. We know that there's politics and control because there's a lot of things. If he had the power, he would be able to do it. The president is the president, but the president also has powers, is controlling, and we all know this. But because he's black, he's supposed to reinvent the wheel and whoa, get it done. It's not going to happen that quickly. It didn't happen with the white presidents. It's not happening with him. And the ones who follow, they're going to have just as much trouble trying to get laws and things passed. Maybe not as much because their skin is not brown. Okay. Now, I'm sick and tired of people talking about Obama this and Obama that. You got to look at the whole picture and see what he inherited and what he's fighting against. I still don't understand why people are against the Obama Health Act, as they call it. Because it's not a black thing, it's not a white thing. I got people that need insurance, you have people that need insurance. And we're paying for it anyway, whether you have mandated health care or not. I know many people that go to the county hospitals for free services, and they can afford to pay, but they don't because they know they can get it free. So not everybody is being asked to do their fair share. Yeah, it's a lot of trouble getting the insurance and trying to get it to work, but there's gaps everywhere. Uh, you know, yes, the computers broke down. It happened, you know, let me stop, because see, you ticket me. I think it's, a, you know, it's just good to hear with you. We're not all supposed to agree, right? That's We're not all supposed to agree, right? Uh, um, can you, yeah, can I? We haven't heard from him yet, so. Uh, hello, ladies. My name is Ray Moore, and I'm a Glazer, a Union Glazer in the city here in 718. And I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing your stories. And my question is uh, the kind of ride on the sisters here, coattail, which she so uh, eloquently articulated. And the way I want to phrase it is, I don't know if you heard about, I try to make the long story short real quick, that the self-hate within the black community, i.e. Uh, Russell Simmons made a video, X-rated, portraying Harry uh, Tubman in a negative light. And uh, mm -hmm. when I first heard about it a couple months ago, I just kind of refused. I said, I ain't even going to deal with it. And then I was on a computer listening off YouTube and just Bam, popped up as I was looking at the Renisha McBride in Detroit. And that uh, horrible thing right there. And so, you know, Dr. Uh, Wesley teaches us racism, white supremacy. And a lot of blacks, especially the men, can't figure out the system that we actually live in. So 
they, you know, they can't figure it out, so they, you know, fall to the pitfalls and the traps. And uh, before I, uh, somebody, a uh, Russell Simmons statue, you know, quote unquote, successful, running around, paying homage, and sitting with the Dalai Lama, that he got this spiritual awakeness and enlightenment and all this, and take an icon on a level of using the white community like Harry Beecher Stroh, Beecher Stowe, uh, was the lady Bessie Ross that did the flag, Susan B. Anthony. So that's what Harriet Tubman means to me. And for her, for him, to somebody of his stature, you know, successful, you know, monetarily and all that in America, and has a platform where he puts artists and things out. But what would be in his mindset for if you have an African American of that statue, statue, to belittle an icon like that of ours mm -hmm. and put it out there for the world to see? So the, the question what I'm trying to ask is, what do you, as you ladies go around America and speak, you know, to different artists and groups, and what do y'all see, or what do you think about the society, and what, what's going on within the black community as a whole to where our mindset, to like the sisters express, we know some things, but we don't even like each other to somebody like that would do one of our sheroes like that. Mm -hmm. So if y'all can just kind of speak on it. Illuminati, uh, you got that going on, which is big in that in that society, in that elite society. Um, negative publicity is still publicity, um, and I say that because right before that, back in February, we had the Little Wayne incident. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, when Little Wayne, uh, how many know what happened? So I don't have to really go into it. He, um, Lil Wayne did a song with another artist, Future, and he um, spewed some lyrics about Emmett Till. He said, it's, it's vulgar, he said, beat that woman's body part, that pussy, of like Emmett Till. Um, and I just went right off. I said, this is not going to happen under my watch, because it was utter disrespect. But it was negative publicity. And Lil Wayne is intelligent enough, he knew what he was doing. I don't care what anybody says. It was negative publicity. But in, in that fight, that was, a, that was a strategic, complete, it was a whole, full-fledged um, an, uh, initiative against him, okay? Um, that was a campaign that we went, we went after him. Got the endorsement deal dropped, but it was in stages. But in doing that, and in doing the research with that, I learned so much about Illuminati and that level, that tiered level, those, those artists who have that kind of money and different things that go on um, from you know, publicists and different ones, things I had heard about. And so the, the whole mental process of where they are and what they're doing is so far gone. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a lot to do with that. I can't imagine Russell Simmons, the, Beyonce, and that whole group. And then when you look at some of the stuff, and I really am not, I'm not this Illuminati person. I'm not, I don't like study Illuminati and get all off into that. But a lot of that, I think, has a lot to do with that Illuminati, you know, stuff. But it also has a lot to do with what the sister back here said. Our, our, our young children and our brothers and our sisters, are, they're not loving themselves. They've lost their identity in loving who they are and in loving and embracing their color and where they're from and their heritage. So I, that's what I think it has a lot to do with, just self-love. And embracing who you are and loving and respecting yourself, you know. Um, if I can, and today I just want to. Well, I was kind of saying what she's saying about the our children not loving themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of children that I mean, I, I'm just saying this because one of the children that I'm talking about was it. There's a lot of foster foster care in the foster care system, mm -hmm. and they're without their parents or their father, and. One of the children, one of the young men that killed, was involved with my son, was a foster child. So I know, uh, and me having raising foster children too, if they're not with their, they, they feel no love, they feel nothing. You know, they're, you know, nonchalant and they just don't care. Um, they're in and out of jail. Um, there's no one there to. I mean, even you can give them all the love if you're the foster parent, but they're, they want their parents. They want their biological parents. Um, so I think that has a lot to do with 
no love there for that, for them. And that caused them not to love themselves. They see other children with their mothers and fathers and they're wondering where their mother and father is. So I think that's a lot of self-hate for themselves that I see in the children today and even in the foster care system. And I really think that's a lot where it comes from too. Um, I have a quick question, and there may not be an answer to this one, but I'm just going to ask, in your work that you have done, is there, you've had successes and you've brought a lot of attention to you, the issues, and I'm just wondering if there's also a slight misstep you might have done that you might want to share about, so because it's good to learn from very experienced people's mistakes as well as their successes. I don't know if you want to share that kind of a story. I have more stories of that nature in my work than successes, I have more mistakes to talk about. But I don't know if you do, but sometimes that's helpful for people who are thinking of getting active to say, you know what, I did this and it didn't go perfectly, here's why, here's whatever. So I don't know if you, if you have something like that. Um, we did a production some years ago for, for one of the anniversaries for Emma Till's um, murder. Was it the 55th we did Mamie's Angels? We did Mamie's Angels, which was a play that I conceptualized and a colleague of mine, he wrote. Um, I felt that we weren't ready by the deadline, and I think that I should have pulled the plug on doing the production by the actual date. Don't you think we kind of rushed and premature we did that, and it could have been better? I think it could. It, I think that it was good. It didn't what it was intended to have done, but it could have had been more refined and could have been uh, have been presented in a different type of venue uh, so that we would have been able to encompass a greater we number of people, loss. I think. I we took a financial loss. Mm -hmm. um, the play was about Maine mm -hmm. and Emmett's mother. It was about her and the work that she did after Emmett died. Um, about the Emmett Hill players and the impact she had on them. And then the audience was full of, of the Emmett Hill players, alum, who, you know, who are adults and their families. And it was like a huge reunion, and there were some complaints from some of the people and how they were portrayed and this and that because of the actors that were selected and such. So I just think that for that, I wanted it to be perfect for the type of, you know, event that it was. I think we learned from that, and then you learn because you always want to make a profit. You never want to take a loss. So that was a financial. Perfect. Even though we didn't make it, it was problem. nice. We had about. <laughs> because sometimes we, we do, we want things to be perfect. And you had time pressure, it sounds like, because it was a specific anniversary that you wanted to do. And then speaking engagements. I had speaking engagements where I was one that I hadn't necessarily prepared. And when I got there, I shot off the top of, you know, the gun. And, oh, well, I've done that. And I felt, <laughs> I felt that it was an after everybody was like, oh, this, you know, you did great, and this was that. But you always want to give your best. And I think, I think sometimes I feel like I might fall short when people say I do okay. I think I'm not, my, my heart is critic. Well, we're our own worst critics because we know exactly what it's supposed to be in our own minds. Right. Right. So other people might not even notice. Yeah. But you know every little part of it. Yeah, the sound system, the venue, the acoustics. I mean, you're still happen. talking about what you should have. I mean, it's right. okay. Well, logistics. It sounds like it's about <laughs> logistics. So. This is logistics. Okay, that's all right. The idea was good and it's not the logistics. Okay. Okay, well. Okay. Are we gonna, we're gonna, did you want to say? Um, um, it's not the same, but okay. you know, I'm just like where we had an event where we had Snoop Dogg come and wanted to do an event for the mothers and fathers who've lost their children to homicide. Mm -hmm. And he came in and he said he alligated us. 
he gave us a big old wooden check and said, this is how much money he was going to give us. And we went to the exotic, we, we had to appear at the exotic erotic bomb with Perry Mason. Mm -hmm. We went there and we were all on the stage with our baby's pictures and stuff, not knowing that we were being used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were being used. Mm -hmm. um, and they used our stories, used us, and turned the money didn't even come to us. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, it was going other way. People were coming in that didn't even have children, mm -hmm. that didn't even lose a child, and was getting that money. Wow. And the money didn't come to us. So it's, the, I really feel, I really, that's, that's the event that I wish I'd never went to, you know. Um, you know, and then not only that, that's, there's other parts where people use our, use us, and then throw us away. That's right. Here, come tell your story over here. You know, so now when I go tell my story, it's going to be on me because I want to do it. Or you're going to give me a stipend. Something, you're going to do something. If I'm going to come shed my tears and let you see my pain, you're not going to use me anymore. You're not going to use us. Thank you for, you know, it's a strange question, but I, I appreciate what you've shared because it's useful for people to hear about that and not to, to avoid that situation. So, thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Right. I just want to, yeah. just, it, it, these are being passed out of meeting it. Jack, are they allowed? No. My assistant back here, <laughs> he's passing them. He should have them if you don't have one. But if you want to find us on social media, find anything about our foundation, please have one of take one of the cards to keep up with us. I'm sorry. So we still have like a, a few minutes, and I'm curious if anybody else has a question. Yes. Yeah, um, in a society in a media that's dominated by the single story, like Newtown, like 9/11 to this day, how do we get the stories that are more important or valuable, or that we are impacted by as a community? How do we get those stories out? And in the public in a way that reaches audiences like Newtown, 9-11, Aurora do. Um, I want to honestly, truthfully, um, our campaign that we had against Little Wayne, social media is a beast. Social media got our story out and got the media calling us. I mean, social media is what really, really helped us just catapult it. Um, I would say any social media campaign, also um, the other platform that was very useful was um, change.org. Mm -hmm. they, they reached out to us. We were going to contact them anyway. Um, but they reached out to us because of the... Um, of what was going on. Someone had called them for us and they called us because of the nature of what had happened and the family and the historical aspect of the family. But those platforms are huge. Social media is almost, to me, bigger than regular uh, news outlets because people are, youth, everybody, they're on there. Um, even on Twitter, like, they'll tell you what's trending news. The top trending news, I'm like, wow. Top, we were top, top. The Little Wayne story lasted for months. It was the story that just never ended. We were tired of it. We were over it, and it was still going. They're still, they're still talking about it. You know, still a few people talking about Little Wayne apologizing on Twitter. You know, so but social media is a beast. That's like the biggest platform. Twitter and Facebook and um, what's the other one that I don't use? The one where you take the pictures. Instagram. Instagram. And is that another? One? There's, there's, there's also like that. putting something out on YouTube and it goes viral. Oh, because we have a YouTube channel, but I have someone that runs that. That's the only reason we have that. Because someone volunteers to do it. I, I don't do that one. Um, we have Facebook and the Twitter and the YouTube. I don't play with Instagram. <laughs> if I can just make a, a quick comment. Um, I'm, an art, I'm an artist activist myself, and I also teach uh, guerrilla theater and activism up in UC Davis. So it's actually there's techniques that I teach in a class called tactical performance and some other 
I teach satire, irony, and protest is another one of my classes. Mm -hmm. I think your question is spot on. And the question is, if you don't have a lot of money, like let's say you don't own your own TV station like mm -hmm. Rupert Murdoch does, somehow mm -hmm. his opinions are always heard uh, in the world, what can you do? And of course, we have some great examples here with our, our, our heroes that are here right now. Um, but there are many examples of and techniques that you can use when you don't have a lot of resources, influence, or people in your pocket, you know, that sort of thing. And sometimes it involves a creative disruption, frankly. Sometimes you have to infiltrate a health insurance conference uh, of corporations, as me and my friends did, and we had a guerrilla musical first out in the middle of their meeting, which went viral on YouTube, and CNN and MSNBC did all things about it, because no one had ever seen that before. Where all of a sudden, people in the audience dressed in suits and ties and looking like they belonged there got up and started singing this song, which satirized the corruption of the health insurance corporations, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just giving you an example. It's not as dignified or important as what the civil rights movement did. I'm not trying to put it in the same category. It's very different. But these are things that now in this edutainment society that me and some of my colleagues in the Yes Men or the Billionaires for Bush, I started a group called the Clown Army. And yeah, we manifest an army of clowns to go march somewhere and intervene, right? And it's just strange and disruptive enough that suddenly there's more attention to it if you the people are getting more. So I'm not going to talk anymore because I'm not the main attraction. But I just wanted to throw that out. That's what I teach and that's what I do. Question. Oh, yeah. What about like these video, like Vimeo and all that kind of stuff? That's good stuff to use. I think so. I think so. If you can't afford your own television station, this is I know thing. a lot of people do YouTube, but what about this other stuff? I mean, I think YouTube is still like really pop. Like Vimeo is great, but I think YouTube is still one of the default places okay. more than Vimeo. And it's one of our holy grails is to call attention to an issue to do something that quote unquote it's a, it's a cliche now, but goes viral, which sounds like a disease. But the idea is like what you do is so interesting and weird that people just pass it around. And the next time you check, there's a million hits. And now people are talking about the problem. It doesn't have to be fu something funny, by the way. It can be deadly serious as long as it's crafted in a certain way. And it, it's not the end-all, be-all. It's only one tiny part of a social movement. I don't want to say that's the most important thing. Because sometimes me and my friends get confused. Like, oh, we we made a successful disruption. And people are, it, so it's only one thing, but it's a, it's a part of it. And I think you two, people are passing it around. And, and at least they're talking about it. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess I wanted to add to what are you saying and in terms of really getting involved in the community. And, um, I work at Eastside Art Alliance at East Oakland. It's a, a, a collective of cultural workers that we work with the community. We do a lot of work and, um, and I don't think you really need to think about you know, the, the media, how you need to approach the media, but just get involved in those organizations, work with the community, try to really like bring some light to those. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what we need to do. I've seen some great people. events. Yeah, and, I, and it's, it's, it's the, just the intention that you, that you need to have in order to you know, change your community. And from there, something might happen or not, but I think it's the intention of going to your community, to those people that are very involved in grassroots and um, I just participated, you know, because there are a lot of things happening. Maybe they are not uh, like in the big, you know, venues or in you know, the big institutions, but I know that there is a lot of people doing grass, grass, uh, grassroots uh, work very deeply in the community. Thank you for that point. It's not only about the spectacular, it's also about what's happening in the neighborhood. Oops. So we have like maybe maybe one quick question because we have like three minutes left. Okay. Is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Are, are we? You have a question? Oh, sorry. This, this person has a question. Yeah, I've spoken already before. So if there isn't anybody else, I will ask. No, I'm just resting my hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what I what I found really interesting in what you said was that Mamie took advantage of the new technology in television to get that image out to show the world what had happened. Because spectacle lynching wasn't anything new; those were destination things. People would trade postcards and pieces of flesh from spectacle lynchings. So, what if you haven't seen um, the performance? What I like a lot about the performance and the music, and I see the composers here is that 
uh, from the documentary and told story of Emmett Till, there's a description of him as being a really light person, and you confirm that, that he was a jokester. And the, some of that music in there, I think, catches that spirit of him, even though there's this heaviness to to the piece. There's this weightedness to it. Um, so there's this, I, I really enjoy that, and just the idea of Mamie using that traumatic experience to try and transform the lives of other people, using that trauma that she experienced to reach out and nurture other children and bring them forward. And it helped because a lot of those that Mamie Till, the Emmett Till players became professionals and were nurtured. So um, just the idea of trauma-informed therapy or trauma-informed works that, that, trans, that are transformative mm -hmm. really appealed to me. The composer? Oh, okay. We'll talk soon. And we have the co author as well. Hello. Yes. I've tried to have Baby's book here tonight to sell. Um, you'll be able to find it on our website. When I get back, I'm going to have a special link to purchase it. You can go on there now and purchase it, or you can get it on Amazon. But if you wait and purchase it when I get back, 50% uh, of the proceeds are going to be a part of our fundraising we have as an author's discount now to raise money for our foundation. Um, she wrote a book right before she passed away. She, she completed it. She co-wrote it with Christopher Benson, who basically came and did some, he directed questions to her to help her write the book. And she finished it right before she passed. She wasn't alive to see it completed and pulled together, but they had finished their part, the portions of the interview. Um, before her passing. And it's a very interesting book. It's about her life and in it. It's not just about what happened to Emmett, but it starts from how she conceived him and, you know, and all of that stuff that I was like, wow, did you know that this happened to Mamie? You know, so, and I haven't read the whole book myself because when I read it, I hear Mamie's voice. And it's very difficult for me. And then it gets long for me. I'm like, okay, this part is boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. But it's a pretty good read if you really want to really get to kind of get inside her, her, her thoughts. And her well, you know the story. Of it. Not when all you say, of it. Okay, okay. Not I'm just saying when you say it's boring, some of it's familiar. Some of it, yeah. Well, when she talks about me picking her up when Dan died and how I was driving and stuff, I'm like, that, I, I cried on that part. You know, when, I, when the book first came out, of course, I looked in the back of the index for my name. <laughs> and I'm like, where am I in the book? What did she say? What did she say? You know, which was only like three parts. <laughs> I was a little disappointed. Well, we all, as human beings, we all do that. You know? I, thought, I, I thought I wore a little bit more talking around the book. <laughs> so, yeah. There's also another book out. We don't have it. Uh, Simeon's Story with yeah, a cousin Simeon. of ours. He was the cousin that was actually sleeping in the bed with him. When they came and took him away, right. so that's another book you might want to read. It is now that's a very interesting read, very very quick read too. Very interesting story. Um, Simeon's story is very interesting to me. Now I have that it is seven thirty two, <laughs> so I guess we gotta wrap it up. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. Um, I just want. Can you please give thanks to our our. <laughs> For those of you who are seeing the show tonight, it's right next door to you. So that's it's fabulous. There's all seen it. Yeah, we're not yet. I'm going to disconnect the uh, mic. Relax. <laughs>